So as you can see, this next section is on the evolution of behavior. And by the end, you should be able to explain both that and how behaviors are traits that can evolve, just like physical characteristics, and to discuss selfishness, cooperation, and altruism in terms of their evolutionary benefits. So behaviors evolve just like physical traits, and this includes taste preferences. So behaviors are going to generally have some form of adaptive value. In general, animals prefer high calorie foods that have a minimal investment. So a crab will go after muscles that are not too small because they won't be high enough calorie, but not so large as to require a tremendous amount of energy investment in order to get the food out. And humans have the same thing. We prefer sweet foods, foods that have lots of sugar and thus a lot of calories, or highly fatty foods, which also have a high caloric value. We also, both humans and other animals, have an aversion for non-caloric foods. When a toddler goes to eat a mud pie, the parent will scold the child and tell them not to eat that. We don't have any strong adaptive value for consuming foods that have no caloric value, and so we have a taboo against that sort of consumption. And so the feeding choices are going to influence your fitness. The foods that you that one chooses to consume are going to influence how fit one is relative to their peers and thus how well they're going to be able to both find a mate and to successfully reproduce. So behaviors can then be influenced by natural selection. If you are a human who tends to go after low calorie foods before modern human society where we had readily available access to foods, this type of behavior could possibly mean that you will starve prior to finding your next meal and thus would be selected against in terms of natural selection. Maternal care is another example. In general, for mammals, we consider it important that mothers nurse and then take care of their young until they're able to survive on their own, but that's generally only selected for in populations of animals that have a low reproduction rate and a small number of offspring when they have offspring. For mice though, where they reproduce very rapidly and have large numbers of offspring, that's not always selected for. And if you've ever had a pet mouse or gerbil or other small rodent, you probably know that you cannot leave the mother with its young because in a situation like that, when you can reproduce rapidly and have a large number of offspring and are in a very small, limited environment, food is likely to be scarce, and so the mother will actually consume the young. And thus maternal care is really not always selected for. And the same thing with behaviors like singing and songbirds. If a male is not capable of either singing or learning the appropriate song, he will not be able to find a mate and thus will not be able to pass along the poor singing ability or lack of ability to learn the species song to his offspring. So which of the characteristics would be under the influence of natural selection? You can pause while you think about it and then come back for the answer. And hopefully you realize that it was all of the above, number five. So some behaviors are innate. They are essentially instincts. They do not need to be learned. <clears throat> and geese egg retrieval is one of these. Since geese have their nests on the ground, if an egg rolls out, the goose does not have to be taught. She will instinctively take her beak and move the egg back into the nest. The same thing with male fish. No one needs to teach them aggression. They will instinctively become aggressive towards other males. And if you've ever tried to have two male betta fish in the same tank, you probably saw how that meets with disastrous consequences. With innate behaviors, the degree to which they're expressed is sometimes going to depend on environmental factors. So you might, if a goose were to lose multiple eggs, she might not actually retrieve all of them. She might only go after to retrieve the largest eggs and the ones that are most likely to be able to survive. 
and the males, if they're never exposed, the male fish are never exposed to another male fish, you might not ever see that male aggression. And for these behaviors, they tend to be triggered by a certain stimuli. So the male aggression is generally only going to happen during mating season when it's important for them to ward off other males. Obviously, you're not going to receive, see egg retrieval in geese unless the, the egg falls out. You're not going to tend to see um, aggressive male behaviors in dogs unless the females are in heat. There, so there are, there's a stimulus, a chemical or a physical stimulus that will trigger these innate conditions. And again, no learning is required and they're going to tend to be fairly consistent across all individuals within that species. But some behaviors do have to be learned. And sometimes they'll be learned and then modified to become, I guess, essentially better. And sometimes they won't be modified, but they still, from the beginning, have to be taught. And some of these are going to be taught easily and learned by all of the members of the population, and some behaviors are, are much harder to learn. So the ones, the behaviors that are easy to learn are called prepared learning, and these are behaviors that are going to be mastered by pretty much every individual within the species. For instance, in humans, acquisition of language. By the time a human is around five years old, whatever their native languages, they're able to speak it. And you see, whether it's a spoken language or sign language, there pretty much aren't any humans who are of normal cognitive ability that are incapable of speaking. Language is prepared learning, as is fear of snakes in humans and in monkeys. With very little training, both humans and monkeys will be afraid of snakes, which is adaptive. It makes sense considering the danger that snakes can hold in the areas where humans were evolving early on. And of course, organisms aren't going to learn everything equally easily. It turns out that if there is limited adaptive value, it takes a lot longer to learn those processes. So with the fear of snakes, there was a study done on fear of predatory animals in danger. And they took pictures, the researchers took pictures of both predatory and non-predatory animals and had in each category animals that were dangerous to humans and not dangerous to humans. They took a population of Amazon indigenous children in a small tribe and children in a school in the United States and showed them pictures of animals from Africa, so animals that neither group of children were familiar with. They taught the children the name of the animal and what it ate, if it was a predator or not, and if it was dangerous to humans or not. And very within one teaching session, all of the children, whether they were urban children in the United States or children living in a highly rural area in the Amazon, within one training session, learned which animals were dangerous to humans and which were not. It took them a greater amount of time to learn the names of whether it was predatory or non-predatory, and took them even longer to learn the name of the animal. The more adaptive it is, dangerous or not dangerous, what type of food does it eat, and then finally its name were learned with increasing amount of time as they were decreasingly adaptive. And so take a moment to think about these and pause the video until you're finished and these I'm actually going to have you go over in class on Friday. So sometimes behaviors seem extremely complex but they don't actually revolve any great amount of thought, and these are referred to as rules of thumb. These are easy to follow because they're going to come with, from a specific cue with a very reliable outcome, 
They're generally going to be associated with either pleasure, an incentive, or reproductive success. And animals don't need to consciously think about the outcome. So an animal, for example, does not need to think, hey, if I make myself look really attractive, then I might attract a large number of mates and I'm going to find the best mate to be able to have the most successful offspring. They just strut their stuff, attract a mate, and have offspring. A complex pattern really comes down to a very simple action. And there's been experiments with rules of thumb. If you click on the image of the goose to the right, you'll see, uh, if you click on the, the top link in YouTube, a 14 second video of this goose going through the egg retrieval behavior. And this behavior actually falls into a pattern that used to be referred to as fixed action. Once the goose starts to bring the egg back into the nest, what you'll see is even if a person removes the egg, the goose will continue the motion, raise up her body to be able to put the egg under her even though there's no egg there. And a similar sort of pattern comes with the incest taboo. In most human societies, there is a strong aversion to incest. There's, of course, a very adaptive reason to avoid incest because the propensity for passing along genetic um, diseases and uh, genetic mutations has greatly increased. But we don't think about, gosh, I don't want to pass along a large number of recessive traits, and possibly with these large number of recessive alleles, we're going to have more birth defects. What we think is, ew, don't sleep with your sister. And most societies have that taboo. And it's so strong that in Israel, where they live in a kibbutz, even though they're not generally related to the 50 or so families, they will not mate with any of the families in that kibbutz. The incest taboo is so strong that even people with whom they are raised are considered too strong a, a friendship. They're essentially considered to be relations, and so they'll look outside of the kibbutz to find a partner. And so while you're looking at this one, if you click on the link that says mating dance, you'll see a bird of paradise going through a mating dance. So pause it, um, click on the mating dance in your PowerPoint, and come back and answer it. And so hopefully you realize that it's not a fixed action pattern because the bird keeps singing even after the female flies away. It's not innate because these birds actually do have to witness other birds going through the song and dance to learn how to do the appropriate song and dance for the species. And this one is prepared learning. They can learn it very easily, but they do have to be taught.